much of what I do in my research and my coaching practice is look at interpersonal boundaries, psychological safety, and mental health in the workplace. And one of the most important and often unseen and invisibilized areas of the workforce is motherhood, particularly those who are what I would call um, intensive mothers, and I say that in a good way, um, mothers who are very involved and engaged with the raising and development of their children, and also those who have outside professions and are balancing in, in many ways two intensive roles, in many ways also empathetic and purpose-driven roles that they have. So with the focus that I'm doing this week with the World Health Organization's mental health um, focus on mental health in the workplace, I really wanted to highlight mental health for mothers and mental health in, in the context of motherhood. Uh, because it's not always a specifically a biological mother who's providing that role, that nurturing presence uh, for young children. Um, so I wanted to share a couple really key areas that I see with my clients and also with research that I do um, related to boundaries and psychological safety with the experience of motherhood. And what I found for myself in my own acknowledgement of these tensions and the, the high degree of overwhelm that can be part of the experience of motherhood uh, was really made clear to me by a lovely um, preschool teacher that my middle daughter had um, a couple of years ago. And she had a very holistic way of looking at child development and education, which was looking at the whole family system, in particular, the primary caregiver, in many cases, the mother. Um, so at the time, I was a a, a, a solo pastor of a congregation doing a lot of caregiving and empathetic driven work while at the same time having at that time two young children under the age of five. And this woman, her name is Leslie, she shared with me the reality of what it means to be a very open hearted parent, a parent that provides a great deal of spaciousness for their child's self development and emotional growth. And I do see myself as someone who approaches parenthood in that way, a very gracious and spacious way of um, parenting that enables my children to really fully come into their own in ways that can make parenting really challenging. It's definitely easier to have sort of a, a locked down approach. One would call it maybe the 1950s model, which I do not believe in. Um, I, I highly believe in structure, but in a very nurturing um, and again, spacious and gracious way. And this, this lovely teacher, Leslie, said that when women in particular approach parenting in that way, then they also go into their sort of outside of the home workspace. It's hard to just shut that off and kind of have this more stoic, especially for women leaders, more kind of executive, traditionally kind of um, non-emotional way of, of working. And so I found that when I was going back to my work as a pastor while also being this very nurturing caregiver, I was much more susceptible and vulnerable to psychological abuse from unhealthy and toxic individuals because I had that giving spirit that I was approaching my work as a pastor, as pastors often do. So I think this is a even um, kind of a more exacerbated experience of uh, questions of psychological safety when women are that kind of parent and then going into a professional setting where there's a lot of emotional projection um, on the part of other people uh, to really take care of oneself uh, because it's a really vulnerable uh, place for being targeted by unhealthy and toxic people. Uh, so that was a really eye-opening realization for me. Um, and it also precipitated my leaving the ministry because um, it was not sustainable for me and I no longer wanted to be put in that position of having to um, sort of go to work in a sense of anxiety that I, I couldn't be the fullness of who I wanted to be in that space. Um, so the couple of things I'm going to look at here um, in this brief video is the, the difficulty of being a mother in the sense of, of suppressing one's emotional landscape. Um, a lot of parents who are, again, in this very um, intentional and in some ways intensive parenting model um, are really conscious and intentional about not projecting their own emotions and frustrations onto their child. And this long term can really create a lot of hardship um, in terms of not visibilizing and not making known what one's emotional state is. Um, and this can be particularly dangerous in the later years after infancy stage because there's not as much attention placed on parent mental health, particularly maternal mental health. You have a lot of research and a lot of medical attention on postpartum depression, but that's not the case once an infant basically turns two and is a toddler when in fact that's when some of the most intense experiences uh, that parents experience, that parents have um, are elevated. 
and that tendency to suppress those emotions in a way that can lead to um, sort of later onset experiences of depression and anxiety for, for mothers and primary caregivers. Um, I also found that a really difficult um, stage is when you have multiple kids in different developmental stages. So at the time of this video, I have three kids who are eight, six, and two. And I find that it's extremely difficult, almost virtually impossible, to parent and cover the needs of all three of those children at the same time based on their developmental stages. You know, I'll be able to triage and address sort of the most um, immediate needs first and then sort of work my way through if everyone's in the same space. But I find that some of the, in, the needs of those different developmental stages are what I would call mutually exclusive. They are almost... Um, against and counter to some of the approaches I would have for a different developmental stage. Um, so for example, my oldest is um, very much aware of responsibility and safety and kind of trying to keep every, she's the firstborn, so this is in some ways typical. She really wants to make sure that sort of everybody is in their lane and um, is doing what they need to do. Uh, whereas my youngest child, who's a toddler, very much getting into stuff and at times in ways that are dangerous. I like to give him the flexibility to explore the world around him in a safe way, but um, you know, he gets into stuff and it drives my older daughter crazy. And at times, you know, she'll kind of look to me and be like, why aren't you parenting? And I say, well, look, it's an intentional way of giving him some space so he can learn his surroundings in, in a safe way. So the, those things are completely clashing. Um, and then my middle daughter, who's very playful, very kind of physically energetic, uh, really wants to play with my two-year-old quite a bit, but doesn't know the strength of her own body and in many ways, many times gets in a situation where, um, you know, I have to intervene for the safety of the toddler. And that makes her feel like she is sort of being punished for something that she sees as natural and playful and relational with her younger brother. So those moments I find to be extremely stressful as a parent because I know that I want to have a different approach based on the developmental need um, and psychological needs of each of those children. And so I have to really ask myself, you know, what's the best way to intervene with the most immediate need and then work my way through, maybe come back to an older child a couple minutes later at the end of the day or have a side chat once my husband comes home from work and I can have a little bit more one-on-one -on -one time with one of the children. Um, so that's a really... Uh, important part of psychological safety for that primary caregiver is knowing that you really can't satisfy all those needs at the same time and give yourself that grace and that flexibility to address it when you have that availability at different times. Overall, um, this is an important um, point as well, is the invisibilization and isolation of motherhood uh, that I think is really important when it comes to mental health. Um, so throughout history, the maternal role has often been invisibilized. I mean, practically speaking, because it happens in the privacy of our own homes, and also because throughout history, women's work has been devalued and has been invisibilized. While that's improving with the past couple of generations, it still is a real societal ill that I think builds into the mental health concerns that in particular I have for uh, you know, working mothers and um, mothers raising children as their primary work. So I, I think an important thing to do is to just talk about some of the things that are invisibilized. For example, um, and I talk about this with my friends and my mom all the time, when a, when a mother is sick, it doesn't matter. When the primary caretaker is under the weather and in a normal situation without children, one might take a day off of work or rest, that is often not an option. And that can be really detrimental to the health of the mother who then is gonna have a longer recovery process even with your basic sort of flu or cold. I think during the pandemic, this was really brought to the surface where even if you had you know, a, a woman at home who was both working and raising children at home when she herself was sick um, and had other sick children, again, this was highlighted immensely during the pandemic, it is a, a, a non-starter, it is a no-go, yet at the same time that primary parent is needing to do the heavy lifting while they themselves are, you know, not on all eight cylinders. Um, and that can be really, uh, not only physically detrimental, but psychologically and emotionally um, extremely draining and damaging. Um, when we don't acknowledge that. Um, another thing that I, I've observed a lot is just the the inability to rest. I mean, a lot of people in my life and, and just previous generations joke that, you know, women just don't sleep until their kids are out of the house in college or in their own lives. They just are cons consistently under rested. Um, and I think one of the main reasons for that is even if one has a really good sleep practice, which I know I do, I typically go to bed by 10 o'clock, 
if there is what I call a pop up at night, my, I, do, I don't do co sleeping, but I, you know, I'm available if there's a need during the middle of the night. And when that happens, you know, maybe once or twice a week with one of my kids, um, it, it really is, in my case, always the mom who's doing that kind of care. It's the child wants, at least in my case, wants me to be the one um, that does that. And so I do pop up and then I never get back um, kind of a restful sleep or an REM sleep. It's just an interrupted night's sleep that I have to kind of catch up with for the next couple of days. Um, and there are so many women who are out in the workforce who are going to jobs first thing in the morning having had consecutive nights like that and to have to perform at the same level without even acknowledging that that's perhaps why they are not able to focus at work one day or are feeling really drained um, or have to cancel a meeting or reschedule. Uh, that there are those behind the scenes areas of the mothering life that are invisible that I think are important to make visible. And I think another thing that really happens that we ourselves as, as women and mothers maybe need to be a little bit more forward about is is describing and discussing and communicating these realities because I think so many times and I do this myself I want to present to the world that I'm a competent and grateful parent I'm happy to have children I chose to be a mother I love being a mother um, and I'm very good at it I'm very competent at it um, and I feel confident in my strengths as a mother but there are times when it is just too much where it is overwhelming where I'm not able to um, really be the kind of mother I need to be in a certain space um, because of those things of rest or being under the weather or being emotionally exhausted. And I think when we admit that to ourselves and give ourselves grace and understanding and, and non-judgment and when we share that with others and also receive that kind of support and non-judgment, it becomes a more safe space to talk about these realities instead of um, sort of swallowing them or minimizing them or silencing them ourselves, um, which kind of then builds into this ongoing invisibilization of motherhood. So having shared that, which I know is going to resonate for a lot of my viewers, a lot of my clients, I probably don't even need to say it, I'm preaching to the choir, um, but I do want to say that there are a couple things that I would recommend um, that can support oneself in this journey. If this is the kind of parent you see yourself as being, uh, again, an empathetic and purpose-driven um, parent, as I always like to share, you know, what are the positive things that we can do moving forward? What are the concrete ways in which we can um, sort of build lives that are more thriving and balanced and really take into account some of these concerns of interpersonal boundaries and psychological safety, and particularly as it relates to mental health and motherhood? I think first and foremost, and I say this in a lot of my videos and my work with women leaders and clients, is that um, it's important to have a small inner circle of trust there really continues to be an expectation in society that women are these relational beings that sort of need to sort of have this larger, broader network. And while that can be helpful in some ways, I do think that it's important for women to really shrink down that inner circle to be one in which those individuals, friends, colleagues, family members are really on the same page with the parenting philosophy of a particular person. Um, and I think there can be spaces for a lot of judgment and second guessing and shaming that can come from a larger circle that's looking in on this really intimate and personal space in our lives. So that small inner circle of trust is really important. And, and on the same vein, really holding strong boundaries um, with relationships that may not be as supportive, that may be looking in, um, again, with uh, a sense of shaming or judgment or even gaslighting experiences that someone may be sharing. So being really intentional about who you share this aspect of your life with and who you ask help for in those times of need. And as I've mentioned before, it's really important to humanize and visibilize these experiences, even when we may be tempted to keep that to ourselves so as not to look like we're struggling or we have this area of incompetence, which is not the case, that we really humanize and make present, make visible the experiences and challenges that really intensive and empathetic caregiving mothers um, are doing and to make sure that the people around us are aware of that and then can be more apt to offer support because it's made evident where those needs are. I am a big believer of maintaining an intact adult self or soul. Uh, for me, um, you know, I'm a work from home mother and my husband works outside of the home. So when he comes home after having been at his job, he knows that I've been negotiating a lot in this home space in particular during the after school time. And we have just this understanding that I, I joke that I'm nonverbal. I am not going to be speaking or talking or interacting for a little bit once he gets home. In fact, I oftentimes just sort of quietly find myself into my room. My kids don't even really know that I've sort of wandered off. And I just close the door, maybe grab a book or check my emails or call a friend or close my eyes. And I just find that I need that buffer, that reset state, that reconstituting time 
to find my adult self that's been really scattered and and um, parsed into all these different roles and spaces and identities um, during the day. Um, I think it's really important, as I kind of mentioned with, with my husband and our understanding of this, is to have a really open um, communication with one's partner if, if one is partnered and is co-parenting with someone. So my husband and I have flip-flopped during different times in our parenting lives of one being the primary breadwinner outside the home and the other being the primary at-home parent. So we both know what that experience feels like on both ends. And I think that's really helpful because, again, I don't even need to say it. When he gets home, I just say, hey, I'll catch you in 30 minutes. And he just knows. And he swings right into that role of the primary parent so I can have that space. I think that's a game changer in a, in a marriage. It's a game changer in sort of a family system that the parents really can intuitively understand what the other is needing, but it requires open communication. It doesn't just become an assumed um, understanding. You know, we are at that point, we've been married for over 10 years now, but it, it, it definitely takes time to communicate those needs. And then you incorporate that into your family routine and family understanding. And I think the last thing for me, um, this has been a big one for me personally, and, and again, something I work with a lot of my clients with is just understanding that we cannot please everybody. And if we have ingrained self narratives of being a people pleaser, and that is how we gain our sense of self value, knowing that we are seen as likable and competent by others, and that's where our self understanding is rooted, we will inevitably struggle with this experience of motherhood because we never will be able to be everything for everyone. When society gets it around its, its mind that that's an unhealthy and unrealistic expectation for mothers, we will have more balanced mothers. And so I think when women are the first to say, no, that's an unsustainable expectation, we are human and we are not to be expected to be everything for everyone. Um, especially in a family system, being everything for the children, being everything for the spouse, being everything for the older generations. Um, so I think when that starts to be pushed up against and really broken down and deconstructed, we will have more balanced, thriving mothers. And I think we do in today's age. I think I am a thriving mother. I think I have um, struck that balance in many ways, but it takes a lot of negotiation um, kind of day to day to make sure that that happens and that Mothers, especially empathetic, purpose-driven mothers, have that sense of self intact and um, they're able to maintain that sense of core identity even while they're doing many things and caring for many people.